Konesti, how are you? Welcome to episode 45 of the Candlelit Tales podcast, and this is the fourth and final episode of our four-part series, The Battle of Ventry. These podcasts are made possible thanks to the support we get from Patreon. If you'd like to support and help us out, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. We really appreciate any help. And if you can't do that, a like, a subscribe, a five star review, if you like what we do, goes a long way too. Now be sure to listen to this podcast with headphones on to get maximum enjoyment. And we will be talking to you about this podcast and the whole epic on our post-show discussion in the following episode. Until then, please enjoy The Battle of Entry, Part 4. All eyes stared at the snarling, snapping jaws of the beastly host running towards them. Fionn stood firm in amongst all of the Fianna dotted along Ventry Bay. Each faction facing this onslaught knew that in moments they would all meet their end. Fionn held his ancient hazel shield in one firm hand, covering over his bent and bracing forearm as the beasts came close enough for him to reach with a single cast of his spear, and as he went to make that throw to signal the attack, he held back, and he glanced at his thumb, not knowing fully what was happening, but knowing he should wait. Just then, some other bright shining spear flew over his head, and straight and true it flew, trailing a thin line of mist behind it as it went straight through the first of the cat heads. It went down with a shriek as the others snarled around it and leapt towards them, but just then, Following that thin line of smoke made by the spear, a heavy mist flew over their heads and swallowed up the entire attacking army all along Ventry Bay. Fionn could no longer see them. A faint and distinct clashing of swords came to his ears, a dull shriek and then silence. The mist that descended so heavily and so quickly receded as fast as it had come, and when the Fina looked at the bay, it was empty. Not a single cat or dog-headed fighter was left there any more. Bewildered and shocked to still be alive, some of the Fina let out joyous shouts of glee and victory. Fionn pressed his thumb between his four fingers and looked from one happy, relieved face of the Fianna to the next. The two a day. They came and saved us. It must have been them. Oscar called to his father, Oshin, who stood as bewildered as the next man next to him. That was bloody easy. I wish they'd do away with the rest of that fleet while they're at it. Grumbled Conan Mwail. Then Fionn spied Fergus of the fair speech, one of the true poets and bards of the Fianna, and his face was white. I can see their shining blades moving in the fight still. I can hear their cries and death blows. This is no easy fight for them, although the fay are slick, sharp and swift. So angled and agile with every movement they make. Those beasts with monstrous heads are fierce and furious and vicious in every way. Fionn put his hand out to his foster son. He knew the veil between this world and the next was invisible for most. Some special few can see in between these realms, but only for a fleeting moment. And besides, time moves differently in the other world. 
So soon his foster son Fergus of the fair speech looked away. He knew that two a day had won, and though they had lost many, they had defeated the army of catheads and dogheads. He nodded to Fionn to signal that this was done, and Fionn nodded grimly in return. Suddenly, a messenger appeared from nowhere. He stood tall and thin, shining armor, pale skin, and bright, piercing eyes staring directly at Fionn. He held gleaming weapons that sparkled and fizzed through the air around them that seemed to run away, and he held them out in his hands and offered them to Fionn. A shining spear and sword that crackled with lightning. He looked at Fionn and spoke. A gift from the Fae and our last action in this. Use it only. After he placed them at Fionn's feet, the stranger stepped away from them and vanished, stepping through the veil, leaving no trace of where he came or went from. Fionn placed his thumb between his bottom lip and top and pondered on this gift. He knew a gift from the Fae should only be used as a last resort, no good could come from them if they were used in any way unwisely. Though they had survived this great onslaught, the vast horde of boats on Ventry Bay still groaned under the strain of the might of the armies of the King of the World, and Fionn knew this war was now far from over. Dara Dunn saw just what the Fianna had seen. His terrible army unleashed, and for the first time, they did not destroy everything in their path. They were met, and more incredibly, it seemed they were overwhelmed. Through the shock that went through him, through the disbelief, there was a small part of Daradun, the king of the world, that almost rejoiced. There would be no easy way out of this war, and perhaps that was fitting. This was the war that would make him king of all the world. This was the final hurdle. And this war would be won in the manner of the wars of his youth. Not with the cat heads and the dog heads, but with his own strategy, his own cunning and his own might. Because Daradun, the king of the world, still had the armies of the world with him. And so he settled in and began to make his plans. No quick battle this would be, but a slow one. And the best thing to do, he decided, would be to bleed them. Very slowly. To send battalions every day. To draw the Fianna out. To wear them down. After all, he could afford the losses. And they, he knew, 
could not. Come, Come warriors. warriors, lay, lay yourselves, yourselves down, down in the healing, the pool. healing pool. Let the Let waters, waters wash, wash your wounds, wounds away. away. Be healed. Be, Be restored. restored. And they did. And at the end of every battle they heard these words from the three daughters of the King of Tiber entice them again back to the healing well. Both Khan and Glass would watch the other mend and heal their wounds, each night rejuvenated and fully healed back to full health, every trace of every fight evaporating like the moisture of the healing well that dried off their skin, leaving behind them no scars or bruises. Every time they saw the daylight, they were spurred on by the healing well's strength to be more daring, more devastating in the fight and more fearless. Each night, with greater wounds, the daughters of the King of Tiber welcomed them again. Come, Come warriors. warriors, lay, lay yourselves, yourselves down, down in the healing, the healing pool. pool. Let the Let waters, waters wash, wash your wounds, wounds away. away. Be healed. Be, healed. Be, Be restored. restored. Each fighting day they watched men and women fall, death surrounding them all on Bentry Bay. But the two of them were always restored after their night in the healing well. And even if one was not strong enough to drag himself to the pool, the other would always drag him back. Their bodies were refreshed once more, but their minds became weighed down by this continuous onslaught, this never-ending fight. And with no release of death, there was no end in sight. As they were watching the leaves of the trees change color, Khan watched Gloss every night make his journey back to the King of the World to make his report as to who had died on either side, as was his promise. But as the days passed, Khan became more suspicious of his friend. He knew Glass could be won over by whoever was treating him the best, and he would turn against a friend or any one of the Fina for a high enough reward. Brooding over this night after night, as he huddled in his blankets watching the landscape around him get colder and colder as his thoughts became darker and darker his trust for glass became weaker and weaker why had he given him this gift of the healing well after all muttering to himself Khan thought I should never have chosen glass McDowell to be the one to use the well's magic with me he would as easily give it away if he knew he would get something for it. Khan knew that he could have given it to so many other worthy men or women of the Fianna that he had seen die up until this day. And so many had died. He had seen far too much of this death friends, clansmen, countrymen alike, and he was sure he had died so many times as well, but every time he somehow had survived. 
Though his body was sound, his mind was broken after such abuse. He knew he could barely take any more of this terrible fight. I wish I was never given this so-called gift in the first place. He saw the seasons turn and turn and turn again from his own ship, from his own fleet, there in Ventry Bay. He sent out the armies in small battalions to draw out his enemies, to wear them down, to grind them fine as the white sand of Ventry Beach. And through all this strategy, he saw the time flowing past him like sand through an hourglass. His world was made of sand. The cold sand that blew and stung in the winter winds. The hot sand that reflected back the summer suns. The sand that was the battleground. The sand that was his arena. The sand that began to feel like his prison. The king of the world could not decide if, after he won, after he conquered this island, if he would build a summer palace here to gloat at his victory, or if he would salt every corner of earth on it and leave it a barren rock and never return. He was certain the right idea would come to him once he had won. But as he looked now at his diminished army and he looked now at his diminished foe, he realised the time was drawing near. The time he had begun to dream of when he would take to the field at last. His huge army was small enough now that he could deploy it all at once on the beach. He could meet that last frayed remnant of the Fianna. And finally, finally, he could defeat them. He, Daradun, the destined king of the world, the king who could not die in any battle because no weapon forged by human hand could kill him. And so the day came when Gloss MacDrowan was making his report to Dara Dunn and Dara Dunn told him to take a message. Tell Fionn McCool that it is time that I will see him on the battlefield. The hypnotizing sound of the waves lulled his mind into an uneasy reprieve. One he was getting all too used to throughout this year-long war. He looked across Ventry Bay and Fionn stared at the surrounding hills that hid it away. The coast clung all along this peninsula and its waves crashed off of cliff faces, inlets, beaches, coves and harbours that were spread out all along it. This was one of the rare bays that offered both such a stretch of wide and shallow beach as well as being cut off and tucked and hidden away in around the base of these many hills. The view from the top of Mount Brandon behind him had given him eyes in all of this remarkable land that stretched out like a hand to the sea. 
where the two distant skelligs were all but sheltered in. And there, closer, the blaskets with unfair moral, the island that looked like a giant lying down on its back, head staring straight up to the sky. For all Fionn knew, this could have been true. Here on this peninsula of Undangin, Fionn had made a home for himself, in amongst the sand dunes for longer than he had ever really been in one place before, he thought. This war had been continuous, relentless, and like the tide itself, it had never stopped. Only for the Fianna being so entwined with their surroundings, being able to use the land to hide in and attack out from, had they lasted this long. The daily tasks of keeping alert, sending runners, small bands sent to ransack the nearby forts, as one left, another army would wait to be deployed from a different part of the bay. For every two they stopped, two more could get through. No matter how many they killed, there was always more the next day. And with great victories came the constant collateral, their death toll mounted, diminishing their numbers, and now they were so few. He did not know could they stretch themselves so thin and not be swallowed up by this last fight. Fionn dismissed this pondering as a negative and useless thought. Today was the last of it, he thought, and today he would fight. He would be alert throughout it, as he must not put a single foot wrong. He sent messages with Fergus of the Fair speech to run along the west side of the bay. And then to Dar Dove, he sent her to the east side. Messages to be dealt out and divided up between the ranks to carefully place and position everyone he had at his disposal. And messages to raise each one of the beating hearts of the remaining Fianna to fight courageously one last time. A fight they were not used to fighting. An all-out war. No more drawing lots. No one rested. Everyone willing and able would face the last of the armies of the King of the World. Still horrendously outnumbered, they would need every trick and every attack to pay off. Every hiding place to go unseen. Every trap laid to work in their favour. This war had been a game of cat and mouse. Played throughout a year, Fionn had known all along the tactics and strategies displayed by the King of the World were always without any regard for the lives he would waste. But as he watched the ships unload the vast army onto Ventry Bay, Fionn was still astonished to see so many. He knew today would be the greatest waste of life. And Fionn knew that before he could enter this fight, he would have to lead from the rear, standing at the very back, in full sight of the attackers, to marshal and to move and make his orders. When the time was right for him to enter the fray, he would. He looked down at his feet, where he kept the poison spear and lightning sword that were given to him by the Fae. They crackled and sparked as if they knew he was thinking of them, but he would not pick them up not until he needed them. Suddenly he looked up to see Dar Dove come and tell him that Oscar was outnumbered 80 to 1. Fionn sent her to run back and get Quilte Macron on to turn in and help him from where he had been sent from and take his numbers with him. She disappeared back into the bay over those sand dunes as he saw Fergus Fionn Vale reach in and around the next sand dune, come back with a similar report. The western flank was overrun, Conan Whale and Gull McMorna were in the thick of it, but soon they too would be swallowed up. So he sent him to move his son Oshin in to flank their attackers and spread out their burden, he hoped. His son was not already overrun. He felt his jaw tighten and eyes begin to brighten as tears began to form from the thought of Hushin fighting for his life. Fionn shook and composed himself and continued to move the factions of the Fianna around like chess pieces. 
as he tried not to wonder how much more time they could last. Dardov came back and she spoke directly to him then. Oscar was outnumbered. 80 to 1 and Quilty came to help him. But Oscar cried out to him to go and find his own fight. Quilty was so vexed, he turned round and killed 30 men. And then he turned back, only to see Oscar was after doing the same. And then between the two of them, they dispatched the rest. Fionn smiled at his overconfident grandson, but sent Dardov back to gather those men and try and push those armies into the centre of the bay. He knew he would enter soon. Dara Dunn was ready for the fight. Dressed in his iron armour, carrying his iron shield, and with the crown of the King of the World on his brow. He watched the fight and waited for his moment. The moment where he would finally end this drawn out war. He was ready with his weapons that had served him well so many times before. And he could see him, the captain of the Fianna. See him there, directing the action, standing a little apart from the others, surrounded by warriors to protect him. And when Dara Dunn judged that the moment was perfect, he leapt into the fray. Those warriors standing guard around Fionn McCool were no match for the King of the World. He cut them down like they were wheat and he the farmer with the scythe, until he stood face to face with Fionn McCool. And at last he was looking into the eyes of the captain of the Fianna, this one who had defied him for a year. Longer than he had been defied and he could not remember how long. And as Dara Dunn glared into the eyes of Fionn McCool, he saw there a will that matched his own. Because Fionn McCool was glaring right back and Dara Dunn could see that Fionn McCool's desire to kill him matched Dara Dunn's desire to kill the captain of the Fianna. And it was with a joyful shout that he leapt into the battle. The fight between them was brutal and hard. They hacked at one another with heavy blows until both of them were cut and wounded and bruised and battered. But Dara Dunn knew that he could not lose. He gave a shout, and with an incredible blow, he cut the top third off Fionn McCool's shield. And he drew back then, to rise up and bring down a heavy strike that would cut the captain of the Fianna in two. But Fionn McCool moved fast, and quick as a snake, he took a strange spear and drove it down through Dara Dunn's foot, pinning the king of the world to the sand. Dara Dunn stopped in astonishment. There was something about that spear that he recognised, and the sword he saw in Fionn McCool's hand thrummed with poison. There was something in that that he recognised too. Was it destiny? Or was it doom? And then Fionn McCool, captain of the Fianna, brought that sword swinging in a wide arc and cut the head off Dara Dunn. 
and head and crown went flying off, and the king of the world thought no more. The entire invading armies saw the king of the world fall, and with that, the rest of their courage fell away with it. The Fianna were rejuvenated and crashed up against them like waves crashing on rock, determined now to push them out to the sea where they had come from. Glass McDrowan saw the crown fall to the ground too, and remembering a prophecy he had heard once before, he made a move to grab it. He knew a woman would be the next to rule the world, and thinking he'd like very much to be on the good side of the next ruler of the world, he went to gift this crown to the only person he could think could wear it. He caught it and carried the crown to Og Aramuk, the greatest warrior in the world that he knew of. She was surrounded by dead bodies piled high, and seeing Glass approach and offer her the crown of the fallen king, she smiled a deadly grin. I am the king of the world now. And it is your turn, O oh men, to fear. It is your turn to be bought and sold. It is your turn to be possessed. It is your turn to be the weak, the downtrodden. It is your turn to endure everything you gave my sisters, my mothers, my grandmothers. I will give to you, and worse. Make ready, men, for the rule of Og Aramach. Fionn had watched Glass move through the battle, and felt sadness in his heart, now knowing the fight was not quite over. He knew another attack would come. Very few who were freshly granted greatness can resist the urge to take it up without consideration. He saw Og Aramuk becoming the very same hate-filled and fueled for destruction type of king as the previous king had been. Although the next king of the world should be a woman, he knew that this woman would be no kinder to Ireland. And so he bowed his head, took his shining weapons, and met her spinning blades in full motion. He leapt into the battle with her, and with the magic of the Tuatidanan moving around his arms, lightning seemed to strike as the poisoned blades struck against Og Aramok and Fionn moved faster and hit stronger than he had ever hit before. And though the fight was brutal, and it seemed it would never end, the end came when at last Og Aramak fell to the hands of Fionn. And those that remained alive were those of the Fianna. Looking at the blood-soaked sand of Ventry Bay, those that lived gave no joyful shouts of victory, but wept tears of gratitude for this fight to at long last have come to its close. All the army of the King of the World, all those who'd come from near and far to conquer the island, lay dead on the beach. As Glass McDrowan walked from corpse to corpse, he saw many he could name. 
heroes and kings and generals, and also soldiers that he had come to know. He came to the body of O Garamok, there where Fionn had cut her down, and still on her brow was the crown of the king of the world. And without thinking too hard about what he was doing, Gloss MacDrowan picked it up. And as he walked on, he came to the body of Daradon himself. And then Gloss thought to himself, There'll be a fine reward for whoever brings back the body of the king of the world with the crown of the king of the world. And the account of what happened here on Ventry Beach. And so he picked up Dara Don's corpse and carried it out to one of the ships. A small one. A light skiff that he'd be able to sail himself. And he started to make ready to cast off. Con Crither was wounded badly in that final battle. Wounded so sore he could hardly walk. Looking for loved ones. Finding them dead. Seeing so much death and destruction laid out. And he felt the rage rise up in him at the thought of these invaders. The audacity of them to come here. The just deserts they were getting now. But then he saw someone pick up the body of the king of the world and rush off to one of the boats. And when he looked about and he saw the faces of so many loved ones dead, so many who had given their last breath on the sand to stop these invaders, he thought no. Not one of them should leave here alive. Not if I have strength in me to stop it. And he pulled himself into the waves. For though his legs would not carry him on land, there was strength enough in his arms to swim. And he swam out to the boat. The boat that he saw that one man getting into. And Gloss MacDrowan looked up at the splashing and saw his friend Con Crither in the waves. He reached out a hand to pull him onto the boat, to take him with him to the other side of the world, where there would be riches and great rewards. Con Crither saw that it was Gloss MacDrowan pulling him into the ship. And for a second, he hesitated. But then he thought, a traitor should get treachery, after all. And when Gloss was unbalanced and pulling him in, Con pulled back and tipped the boat and the two of them went under the waves together and neither Gloss MacDrowan nor Con Crither of the Fair Face ever came to the surface again. They sank beneath the waves and the crown of the King of the World sank with them. The crown of the king of the world is under the waves and let it stay there. The world is not yet ready for its next ruler. It is prophesied that the next king of the world will be a woman. But it will be in an age when a woman king is nothing strange 
And she will not rule by force, she will rule the world truly. To her, all the peoples of the world will be her Fianna, her clan, all men, her brothers and fathers and sons, all women, her sisters and mothers and daughters, all people, her people, all different, all beloved. To her, the world will be small and precious. She will hold it and lead her people to heal it as though it were a wounded child. Until that day comes, let the crown of the king of the world stay with Mananan MacLear, the king of the sea, the god of the ocean. And when she comes, it will be for him to give it to her. But until that day, we, the Fianna, will live by our code. Purity of heart, strength of limb, and truth on our lips. Gaurav Mila Magat. Thank you for listening to this four-part series, this special edition, first time telling, multi-part series in a radio play kind of way. We're not quite sure what we did, but we hope you liked it anyway. We'll be talking about this epic, the epic of Ancian Fion Tra in our next episode, and we invite you to get in contact with any questions about the themes that are in it, or ideas, or any issues that struck you so that we might discuss them at length. There's an awful lot to talk about, so we'll, we'll get there in the next episode and hopefully pull it apart to a satisfactory point of view. There's a few thanks that are due before I do that, though. Thank you, patrons. That's a thank you to all the Patreon supporters. You've helped us buy sound equipment, pay internet bills, and get Oshin Ryan new editing hardware and software. They've gone to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales to give us a little bit of a... Uh, yeah, monetary value to help us along. And we're releasing bonus material as well as early releases on our uh, Patreon page. You can also give us a one-time donation on PayPal link via our website, candletales.ie. We are opening up slowly and looking at doing bookings in outdoor venues. And if you're in the island of Ireland, do get in contact. If you're in schools and you want us to come and tell stories to kids, we do that too. So be sure to get in contact if you want us. And I guess now the credits can roll for this whole epic. The story was constructed by Aaron and Surika Hegarty based on the bilingual Irish and English book by Egon Omarhartig and Donald Ulrich. It's a beautifully illustrated book as well, so we highly recommend you pick up that book if you want it. This podcast, as well as all of our podcasts, are produced and edited by Oshin Ryan with sound and music by Oshin Ryan. There were also some additional voices by Neil Toner, Rue O'Shea, Oshin Ryan, Nelson in the Ballet, myself and Sorka Hegarty, my sister. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Tune, ex- tune in next time. And until then, keep it lit. Keep it candlelit. <laughs> you.